Welcome to Series 4 of the Public Interest Technology PIT Colloquium. We are delighted to be hosting you this series and have an engaging program lined up. My name is Rova Abbas and I'm a Senior Lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia and the Socio-Technical Systems Technical Committee Chair at the IEEE. I'm joined today by my co-host Katina Michael, who's the Director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University, and is also the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. Katina and I would like to acknowledge the work and support of Cindy Dick, Melissa Waite, and the events team at the College of Global Futures at ASU. Before we welcome our guests for today, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the series to date. We journeyed from Series 1, which focused on values, responsible innovation, and COVID-specific technological responses, to Series 2, which centred on storytelling, imagination, and participatory design methodologies, then to Series 3, which emphasised the global perspective with respect to the social, regulatory, and ethical considerations relevant to the design, development, and delivery of technology in the public interest. In this series, which is series four, we illuminate a path toward transdisciplinarity, hosting international speakers who will share with us their perspectives on experts and expertise, innovation ecosystems, multi-stakeholder approaches, and the opportunities and challenges relating to the um, addressing of complex social or societal challenges. Today's session will involve three presentations addressing areas such as risk profiling, the right to be forgotten, and open government. We would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Scarlett Wilcock. Scarlett Wilcock is a lecturer at the University of Sydney School of Law. Her research explores the introduction and effects of new technologies within welfare regimes, including how these technologies may shape or transform welfare law, policy and practice. She is an associate investigator at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society and a member of the Board of Directors of the Welfare Rights Centre in Sydney. Dr. Wilcock will be presenting today on risk profiling in the welfare state. Welcome, Scarlett, to the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. Thank you so much, Rova. Uh, so today, what I wish to talk to you about um, is an examination of algorithmic risk profiling in the welfare state with a focus on the Australian context. And I'll start by briefly outlining my approach, um, as well as the use of risk profiling more generally in post-Keynesian welfare states. This presentation represents a, one chapter of a book um, that is due for publication next year, which is, represents a larger study on welfare fraud policing. Uh, and this is something that examines all the tools and technologies used to police the problem of welfare fraud and non-compliance from identity verification, data surveillance, etc. The focus today, of course, is on risk profiling technologies, but this is a quite a significant part of this overall compliance regime. In this analysis, I'm quite in, in, informed and influenced by the critical list, rich, literature, which urges a contextual approach uh, and also sees these systems as, as forms of governance, or at least part of assemblages of governing uh, populations. And also to see these systems not as fixed, but as um, malleable as I've already foreshadowed. It's also relevant to note that I come at this research as a socio-legal scholar, trained in sociological methods, this uh, including some experience as a lawyer representing welfare recipients in Australia. So this enables me to draw important insights and perhaps different insights, but it also limits the analysis that I can draw, um, especially from a technical perspective. And it really underscores the importance of future genuinely interdisciplinary work in this area. The data that I draw on today derives from interviews with Centrelink compliance officials, including data miners, intelligence officials, uh, and um, uh, social security lawyers as well, as well as uh, large documentary data sources, including public documents, but also lots of documents um, garnered through the Freedom of Information process. So looking at risk profiling in the post-Keynesian welfare state, um, I, I suspect it comes as no surprise to anyone that um, algorithmic risk profiling and scoring and ranking systems are really, they've really become a common feature, particularly in Western post-Keynesian welfare states, but also beyond those. So we see examples elsewhere as well. A review of the literature, including um, a 2019 report from the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty on the Digital Welfare State, 
demonstrates the prevalence of these systems and it also highlights the common uses of these systems. So there's sort of three common uses or areas in which these systems um, operate in the welfare state. The first and most common is fraud and compliance. The second is in relation to child protection. And the third is about risk and need scoring. So this a system might, for example, predict the welfare recipient's likelihood of long-term unemployment and determine the level of service that that person um, is therefore met with. In relation to fraud and compliant clients, which is really where the, the majority of these systems can be found, um, these systems tend to employ advanced data analytics, um, a variety of kinds of techniques to analyze recipient data, to, to identify and target welfare recipients at apparently higher risk of non-compliance or fraud. It might be focused on a particular kind of risk, such as identity fraud, or a particular population, a subset of the welfare population, such as the unemployed. Um, and increasingly, what we see is risk profiling techniques are evolving using larger data sets, uh, more sophisticated, more dynamic and automated technologies, um, including machine learning. However, generally speaking, the kind of most sophisticated machine learning, it's, it is, the uptake of that has been slower in the welfare state, especially compared to, say, private sector domains like advertising. So we still see a lot of kind of older style um, predictive um, techniques being used in the welfare state, including in Australia. A recent very high profile example of a kind of system that I'm talking about comes from the Netherlands. Um, it's called Serial System Risk Indication System. It came to prominence in 2020 because it was successfully challenged um, and ceased operation. So a domestic court in the Netherlands found that the system breached the um, right to privacy in the, the European Convention on Human Rights and it had to cease operation. So quite a rare example of this kind of successful legal challenge. The system basically in very crude terms used data held by a number of public agencies to identify individuals apparently at higher risk of engaging in welfare fraud. Um, it generated a list of individuals which were then sent to agencies and that provided the basis of, of targeting people. So effectively a recommender system. This system was exclusively used against poor and low-income neighbourhoods and um, ethnic minority neighbourhoods. This it, it was challenged on that basis, as I said, and, and, and subject to severe criticism, including from the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, which called it, uh, explained that it involved an element of victimisation and discrimination that should not be sanctioned by law. Australia, which serves as the empirical focus of the talk today, continues to employ very similar systems. And it's these to, the, to these that I'm going to turn you to now. So to provide a little bit of context on um, the Australian welfare state for um, those who may not be familiar with it, um, basically we have a national human services delivery, delivery agency known as Service Australia, and the welfare arm of that is called Centrelink. So welfare payments are known as Centrelink payments. In comparison to uh, the welfare states, I'm particularly thinking of the very fragmented or much more fragmented system of social protection in parts of the United States. Australia's system is really centralised, it's national, it's very bureaucratic. Um, it's the, the same payment rates, rules, um, and apply across the country. It's targeted, very, so it's a means-tested, highly targeted system funded from general taxation with payments for different categories of people excluded from the labour market, so uh, parents of young children, the unemployed, people beyond working age, students, etc. <clears throat> In terms of the development of new technologies, a lot of this is actually in-house and that can contrast to other places where it's, there's much more outsourcing. So certainly Centrelink buys off-the-shelf software, it might contract consultants to adapt, modify that software or um, create technical solutions. But a lot of the development, maintenance, implementation of new technical systems is actually in-house. So that by bureaucrats who are also experts under bureaucratic control, and that can be um, quite different to some other locations and jurisdictions. The first case study is data mining risk profiling project. So in the 20, uh, 2009 to 10 budget, um, the Australian government um, provided funding <clears throat> to the Centrelink to establish an ongoing data mining capability in Centrelink that would help identify customers most at risk of receiving incorrect payments. According to Centrelink interviews, um, and this is supplemented by publicly available information, 
The Darting Mining Team was soon established after this. They used SAS Enterprise Miner software, employed a range of data mining techniques, decision tree methodologies, association rules, etc., to identify patterns and characteristics in the customer data associated with non-compliance and fraud. And that informed, uh, effectively informed decisions about um, who to target uh, for non-compliance and fraud. As one interview explained, we'll usually identify between 30 and 100 parameters. Um, we'll use this as inputs into the model, select the most relevant subset to use, etc. As you can imagine, the data available to Centrelink, and this is reflected in most other uh, welfare agencies elsewhere, these data are vast. Um, and they're often highly sensitive. So the most re relevant um, categories of data available for um, data mining risk profiling are these three categories. The first is demographics of the data, and that captures all the personal information about recipients and their families, so the, the partners and children as well, that think things like gender, age, um, postcode, those that kind of information. The second um, set of data is called transactional data. So that's data derived from recipient engagements with Centrelink. So when a recipient calls the uh, Centrelink, that's a transaction. Um, if they register a change of address, that's a transaction. Um, and so a transactional data might capture the type of transaction, how it's done, for example, phone online, the outcome and any tasks that are triggered. So sequences of tasks as well um, that bureaucrats then follow, whether they're automated or manual. And finally, of course, debt and fraud data. And this is effectively or can be a subset of transactional data, but basically um, debts raised against recipients, usually within a historical, so historically defined time period, um, also uh, fraud prosecutions. So as you can see from the previous slide, the customer data includes highly sensitive information. You can add to this list things like disability status, um, uh, uh, gender as well. Um, this is one of the key concerns with this kind of risk profiling in the critical literature is that risk in instruments, risk po profiling systems rely on variables that acts as, acts as proxies for gender, race, class and so on. Um, which can reinforce extant inequalities. These are kind of decontextualized, taken away from historical processes of disadvantage and marginalization, uh, and then inputted into, into these, um, these systems. But in Australia, it's of course, not just the subtle correlations between these things. We actually use <laughs> the, the direct, direct correlates, but correlates. We're directly putting in um, things that might be um, gender, et cetera. Um, so you can see from this quote here, um, that from one of the interviews. So, you know, we might end up with a profile of someone who's male age between this age and that age um, and ethnic background. Not that we worry too much about that, you know, and it talks about school leaving, etc. So you can see this is, of course, an example rather than, you know, used as an example rather than a concrete kind of in-use model. But it, the kind of casualness with which these variables are talked about is telling. It suggests a kind of minimal awareness of what the significance of using these kinds of variables mean, um, and also the kinds of variables that just are fed in as a course, you know, that, that are the standard to put in. Um, and certainly suggests minimal awareness and suggests that there's not sort of any um, systematic processes to, um, to correct or, or manage these potential risks of, of these things emerging. In fact, if you have a look at all the variables that I've come across that are correlates or risk factors associated with non-compliance, all of them are correlated with disadvantage, or virtually all of them are found, a dis uh, are found uh, connected to disadvantage. Um, so um, some of these come from consultants that publish papers. Um, so just to give you an example, um, the, there's this um, academics from the University of Technology Sydney acted as consultants and in some one of their papers they identified um, for example um, customers aged 21 to 28 who rent have a partner earning casual income as having a higher probability of welfare overpayment on the other hand customers that um, use only one service centre uh, and receive regular payments were um, um, had less likely to incur overpayments. There was quite a lot around home ownership. So if you owned your own home, didn't change service centre compared to if you were renting and casual income. So that where, where the, the, the former was less likely to get into the, the, the latter is more likely to get into debt. 
Um, and so this seems to suggest to me, uh, when I look at these variables, I think one suggests housing insecurity and the other suggests housing stability. Um, but there was sort of no reflection on this. Um, similarly, being male, uh, uh, so, so gender kept emerging as a predictor, as a, as a useful predictor. So being male was found to be associated with incurring less debt, repaying more debts quickly. And um, on the other hand, um, uh, a female, being female was associated with higher levels of debt. Um, and according to another informant, uh, another risk factor, and I quote, number of children. You can almost understand families on a benefit are really vulnerable, not much money, large numbers of children. There could be a tendency not to tell us um, something that they should, um, that, that would have their payment reduced. Um, so a, a minor insight there that um, nonetheless fed into these models. Um, and from all these variables, I, what I saw is a pattern in which I thought certain types of recipients were more likely to be targeted. Um, unemployed recipients, um, on kind of more casual and insecure uh, work in housing um, and single mothers. Uh, that was the kind of things that kept coming up. Obviously, not all the time, this is, in, you know, this kind of thing, but this seemed to be a pattern. And what I thought that this really obscures the fact that these two groups, unemployed recipients and single parents, have long been targeted more frequently in the welfare state. That's not necessarily because they're more likely that there's evidence they're more likely to get into debt. Um, the, the targeting in the past, which I suspect is embedded in the current data, um, in the data data, is tends, and I would argue, is much more related to um, kind of moral anxieties about the um, these these you know entrenched moral anxieties about these payment recipients who have apparently failed to get a job or indeed a man. So, what are the effects of data mining risk profiling? What did I see? I'm drawing on the kind of uh, this looking at this um, overall, I saw three interrelated effects um, that I'll talk briefly about. The first was uh, a veil of objectivity. So the interviewees spoke of the process as data mining techniques and systems as if they were neutral and objective and they placed trust in them. There was deference to them. In the words of one interviewee, and I quote, we let maths and science take over. And this assumption of neutrality, in fact, masks the moral judgments involved in the processes of social security data mining, including the decision to undertake it in the first place, but also suggests a sort of minimal or lack of awareness of the potential for biases to be embedded in data and be reproduced in models. A related problem that I found was what I'm calling distance. So the, what I saw was this creating a distance between bureaucrats who are now technicians or at least uh, between, between bureaucrats um, and the collective impact of their work so and their targets, so welfare recipients that they're targeting. One issue I was keen to investigate in my research was the reason why women and particularly single mothers were overrepresented in um, uh, uh, fraud prosecution statistics. And I put this to all interviewees and not one knew about this fact. So all of them expressed surprise. Uh, and here's what um, uh, one of the interviewees said um, in relation to that, putting that back to them. Well, I have to admit that I didn't know that. When I look at prosecution results and data uh, and the data that comes back and forth, and because I work in the Centrelink mainframe, I guess my excuse is I've always looked at cases based on the populations they come from. And I'm so analytical, it's not really people, okay? <laughs> but it is people, isn't it? Um, but you can see how this creates this distance between the technician now, the bureaucrat as technician, and the outcomes, that the social and other outcomes of, um, of, of the work here. So what this suggests, and ultimately the kind of outcomes, is that this kind of system suggests the burdens of risk pro profiling are tending to coagulate um, and, and um, disproportionately affect already disadvantaged uh, welfare recipients, and this may just propel the disadvantage that those groups are already facing. What's interesting is that risk governance and, 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 and risk profiling is having really different effects elsewhere in the welfare state. And it's important to note these haven't replaced what I just talked about. These are alongside, okay, so they're not, not a replacement. Um, in around 2015, a new tiered compliance review regime was introduced and it continues to operate today pretty much unchanged. So a few tweaks, but fairly unchanged. Basically, it involves the use of data analytics and data mining to rank payment recipients by their apparent risk non-compliance. 
associated with sort of high level program risk. So not reporting income, for example, if you have casual income. The risk that the person, the risk score determines the tier of intervention and there's three tiers. So the bottom is sort of the least interventionist in indirect in intervention. So an SMS message, for example, to prompt or remind people to, um, to report their income. Early intervention is the next step up, usually involving a phone call, an educative moment, if you like. And direct intervention is more about a more um, familiar form of um, payment review. This system is explicitly informed by behavioural economics and the kind of nudge approach that some of you may be familiar. And the core goal was to kind of maintain compliance um, results, um, but reduce the number of costly compliance reviews. So efficiency really being core there. In many respects, this bears all the hallmarks of kind of neoliberal active welfare state. Um, the focus is on individual failings, modifying individual behaviour that apparently needs correcting, a core goal is efficiency, um, et cetera. But actually what I found in this particular setting that um, staff were engaged in a little bit more than that. There was a kind of adaptation of this, this process. Um, and what I saw was certainly a more complicated picture. So what I saw was that the approach led to far less accusatory, intrusive and ultimately softer interactions between staff and welfare recipients. Again, this is in one setting. I think overall the experience of welfare recipients is of a punitive system. But in this particular site, this was occurring. It, it seemed to change the way Centrelink staff perceived the problem of welfare non-compliance in, in the first place. In, yes, it was, it was about um, individuals um, need to for compliance but part of it was also a, a sort of subtle systemic analysis of the social security and it's being too complex as a problem and that was kind of built into this system um, and the, the interviewees I spoke to all spoke positively about this and about them being able to trust um, welfare recipients so at least in those first two tiers of intervention the welfare recipient's account is taken at face value. There's no independent verification. There's no intrusive calls to their employer, the kid's school, et cetera. Um, and so it seems to temper this assumption, this general assumption that recipients are dishonest. In this way, the idea of risk of non-compliance is remedied. It's in some way reconceived as needs. So instead of risks of non-compliance was um, the person is in need of education. The system is in need of reform and um, sim simplification. I'm not suggesting that the system is unproblematic and it can lead to many of the problems I spoke to in, um, in relation to um, the risk, uh, risk profiling, the data mining um, activities. Um, it's still primarily focused on post-COP management rather than prevention. It still has a kind of soft systemic analysis rather than really taking on what could be root causes of welfare non-compliance. Um, and still this kind of politics of nudge nonetheless focuses on individual behaviour modification. It still presents to some extent recipients simply as lacking the skills, knowledge and agency to manage their lives while, rather than inquiring whether the system itself um, is in, in, indeed the system of well provision, pro, welfare provision as a whole is legitimate, fair and effective. But it's nonetheless a really strong reminder of how these systems can play out quite differently um, depending on their context and goals and staff um, to which they uh, are responsible for them. Um, and it's you know really important to keep an eye to this kind of nuanced and unexpected outcomes. In the final few minutes, um, and I hope that I've got a few minutes, is that <laughs> right, Rover? Um, that I want to just briefly reflect on sort of what's happening now and what might happen next. Um, in the, Most of these interviews were undertaken in 2014 and 15. The documentary data has been updated since, and I haven't been able to do other interviews. The uh, welfare state has been a little bit less um, inviting to researchers in recent years. Um, Nonetheless, from what I can gather, there's two key developments that are worthy of um, uh, consideration. I don't think these have really changed the processes so far. I would suggest that change is more incremental than transformational um, because there's not necessarily evidence that these things are currently affecting how welfare fraud com and compliance work is operating, but it might, and therefore I think it deserves um, critical attention. So the two things that I think are most significant is, well, the first is the availability 
of more and new types of data to the welfare state. So Centrelink continues to collect that kind of demographic and transactional data associated with claiming and receiving welfare payments. But the rapid expansion of the digital welfare state means um, that there's just been an expansion in the variety of quantity of data available. According to Centrelink's data analytics privacy notice, Centrelink now captures uh, things like claimants' IP addresses, screen size orientation, mouse clicks, mouse hovers, how claimants move through web pages, etc. Other information includes uh, and data includes biograph um, uh, biometric data when recipients set up voice prints. Um, there's location data in apps and things like that. So, in broad broadly speaking, the data available to Centrelink is more voluminous, more diverse, more granular. Um, and far more removed from the official file. So the other data was very much part of that official file. This is moving beyond that. At the same time, we know that um, techniques for, for data analysis and data analytics are multiplying and, and, and diversifying and, and becoming far more sophisticated. Um, so there's obviously the kind of um, development of machine learning technologies, et cetera. As I said, there's not a great deal of evidence that this has all been used in, in the compliance work yet. These data could be, there's nothing to stop Centrelink from using these data. Um, and what I can gather, the, the real push has been for sort of real-time uh, risk profiling. And that's really been the only push. I can't see um, uh, significant other changes. Nevertheless, if we were to see these changes implemented, I think there's three things that might um, could be outcomes to this or things that we could watch and, and, and explore further. So in combination, these developments could create more, even more distance between welfare compliance officials and recipients um, who are the targets of compliance work. So of course, it, this is something I spoke to in relation to data mining, but it would be an intensification of this, this issue. So the introduction of more sophisticated technologies could just increase that deference to these systems and reduce opportunities for understanding, reflection, adaptation, including that contestation that I spoke about in relation to the tiered compliance model. Um, at the same time, as algorithmic risk profiling might become more sophisticated, it becomes less explicable, perhaps less contestable. So this is not obviously not a new problem. There's already a level of sort of impenetrability here, but there's at least some capacity, even for me, a non-technician, to sort of reverse engineer hypotheses or at least ask questions about this, meaningful questions about um, these kinds of variables, about why. The, the further that these systems move away from consideration of why, why may no longer be important. Um, I think our capacity to um, to challenge the systems is reduced as well. We're expected to sort of accept um, these inexplicable algorithms on faith. Um, and, and this is obviously going to become an even serious problem, very serious problem if what we find out is that they um, are in fact um, systemizing harm. However, I think that machine learning risk profiling could have the capacity to redistribute and disperse welfare surveillance in surprising ways. So all of a sudden, if we're not just focusing on that official file, what happens if we chuck mouse clicks into the mix? Maybe that might disperse and shift attention from single mothers, maybe for a moment, maybe it won't. Uh, I think that we should be aware and, and open to the possibility of interesting outcomes here that may displace or at least modify some of the traditional social categories that keep emerging in these kinds of systems. Um, it also has, at the same time, the potential to lead to new forms of discrimination, which may be less visible to us and harder to sort of detect. Um, as Man and Matza explained, the input and output of algorithmic systems may not have a direct relation to a protected ground, such as race class, for example. Um, but it might still be the case that an algorithmic system systematically disadvantaged persons with, say, a specific combination of browsing history, make of computer, etc. So algorithmic profiling may ultimately bring about systematic disadvantage for a for an un otherwise unnoticed group of people. Alternatively, and this is many scholars would suggest this, it may just simply continue to propel familiar patterns of discrimination, um, a systematic discrimination to their predecessors, albeit in more invisible and insidious ways. Um, it still tend to use decontextualized data, um, obfuscate the significance of ethical or social effects, 
um, et cetera. So ultimately it would seem that the introduction of sort of smarter algorithmic profiling technologies and new data in the, in the welfare state may intensify and enlarge existing problems, um, but it also may create um, and alleviate some. Uh, it may do so in surprising and unexpected ways. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I'll take any questions, of course. Thank you so very much, Scarlett. Um, I think your talk really speaks to the importance of the critical lens regarding risk profiling effects, the rearticulation of risks. You spoke to tiers of intervention and some of the challenges that we need to address, certainly in the context of the digital welfare state and risk profiling, more specifically where potentially risk needs to be reframed in terms of needs. I really appreciate how you ended the discussion with some of the interesting outcomes that come with the introduction of sophisticated technologies. We will have a chance to reflect, hopefully, and ask some questions, um, many questions stemming from your excellent presentation. But first, I'll turn to uh, our second speaker for today, Dr. Andrew Whelan. Andrew Whelan is a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Wollongong in New South Wales, Australia. His research interests lie in the relations between emerging technologies and formal and informal social organisations. Dr Whelan has published his research in a range of outlets, including communication and critical cultural studies, critical social policy, critical sociology, and the sociological review, among others. Um, currently, Andrew is working on algorithmic social welfare and processes of data erasure, and additionally writing a book for MIT Press, or provisionally titled Destruction of Documents. Dr Whelan will present today on the topic of the right to be forgotten has a material history. Over to you, Andrew, and welcome to the colloquium. Thanks, thanks, Robbie. Uh, so yeah, I, I have some slides, but they're really just to kind of help me sequence the uh, the argument. They're pretty kind of um, minimalist, so I'll speak with them rather than um, to them, as it were. So yeah, I'm, I'm Andrew Whelan. I'm at the University of Wollongong. Uh, my email is up there. I, I like talking about these things, so drop me a line if you uh, if if you if you want to communicate about these things. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, thanks for having me, Roba and Katina. Uh, and I'd also like to just take the opportunity to thank Roba and Scarlett, uh, because I've learned a great deal from talking to you both uh, about, um, you know, data and datafication and these types of large scale processes. And I'm, I'm just glad to have the opportunity to kind of get that on the record somewhere. Um, so this is what I'm talking about is chapter three of the book that uh, Roba mentioned. And this is about the, um, the, the right to erasure or the right to be forgotten in the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, Article 17 of the GDPR, which is European Union legislation, which came into effect in uh, 2018. And it's uh, the, essentially the most stringent data privacy uh, protection regulation in the world. Uh, the so you, you can there's something sort of I interesting about it, which is uh, as you can see the 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 right to be forgotten is given in brackets in the title of this uh, piece of legislation, but the right to be forgotten does not appear in the main body uh, of the text where where it's formulated as the right to erasure. So somehow, sort of historically, these two things got smudged together in, in kind of an interesting uh, way. And, uh, and that's what I'm part of what I'm going to try to sort of uh, unpack or rummage around in is um, how that came about and what that what that means and what kind of limits that that puts on things. So uh, this is a kind of overview of what I'm going to uh, to do or to to try to say. I'm just going to first talk about how essentially how I'm sort of, as it were, methodologically situating erasure. Uh, so trying to talk about erasure as a practical activity rather than a, uh, a sort of a principle. Uh, I'm also going to try to situate erasure in terms of the, uh, or rather to situate Article 17, erasure as given by Article 17, in the context of European history and in the context of recent, uh, uh, what we know about recent um, government um, surveillance uh, that occurs via digital uh, media. Uh, I'm then going to talk about the, the, the history of erasure in, in expungement and the droit à l'oubli, uh, the right to uh, be forgotten or the right to oblivion uh, in, in French uh, common law and European common law and in the 
in the United States, uh, a, a legal oblivion, as it were. Uh, and then I'm going to essentially make the case, which is that relative to what I'm going to call the sociology of the FAMG, uh, and by that I mean the big tech um, oligopoly, right? Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. I don't know why it's not now. I, I suppose it should be called the MAM because presumably it's now Meta, Alphabet, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. But anyway, that's just confusing. So I'm just going to keep calling it the FAM for now. Uh, and I'm going to describe what, what I'm going to call the, the sociology that they conduct, which is the basis of their business model and how Erasure essentially doesn't, it seems like it's going to go near there, but it doesn't actually touch that. And then I'm going to suggest also that it individualizes the data subject in a, in, in a problematic way, um, rather than engaging directly with the implications of uh, datafication. So for that reason, I'm, I'm going to say that individual rights are a rather peculiar uh, politico, legal uh, and discursive um, mechanism. So uh, where I kind of come from as a sociologist, uh, is what you're looking at there is a quote from Dorothy Smith, and this is a type of uh, sort of sociological orientation called institutional ethnography, which uh, where the interest is in trying to follow the uh, social and administrative uh, implications of the circulation of media or the circulation of texts and the formulation of texts and their affordances. So what texts do in terms of how they sort of constitute people and constitute people's movements and relationships relative to large organizations. Uh, so one of the sort of key, a kind of bedrock principle in, in this approach is that you, rather than getting kind of hung up on the meanings of documents or on what documents might say or what data might say, you try to just keep paying attention to what they do and to how they're used and to how they sort of coalesce or disperse uh, people or social or economic or political power uh, around them. So trying to keep sort of paying attention to text in, in, a, in a very generous interpretation of what a text is, right? So not just, you know, a document or a book, but, you know, a video or a, a set of emails or a set of PDFs or, or indeed uh, data. So in institutional ethnography, you know, we kind of people acknowledge you, you can't really get away from political and sociological arguments about how things are and how they got to be the way that they are. But the sort of premise is that you can shed some light by just trying to stay with the material practices uh, of the circulation of media and their historical development, right? To look at what we're doing rather than why we say uh, we're doing it. So uh in that way then by trying to pay attention to what it is that people actually do with with media we could try to shed some light on why they claim they have organized things in in the way that they in the way that they have so it's an, another way to try to get some kind of critical purchase on on what's going on so uh e erasure uh is viewed, the right to be forgotten in the GDPR is viewed sometimes by uh, American legal scholars as contentious insofar as it seems to run contrary to First Amendment free speech rights. Uh, and one of the reasons why that can be confusing is because Europeans don't necessarily say it very explicitly, but Europe, the European sort of culture of privacy and data management has to be situated relative to European history in the 20th century. So Europeans are extremely sensitive about population data. Uh, France does not collect census data on ethnicity or religion. Uh, in, in Germany, there have been census boycotts. Uh, notably, there was a, quite a big one in 1983. Uh, Germans became especially sensitive about census data when it started to become handled electronically. So in 1978, uh, in Germany, there was a Federal Data Protection Act, which distinguished data, uh, it distinguished digital data from data gathered via documents. So this is a long running concern uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, and this is, of course, partly to do with the consequences of the Second World War and the Holocaust. So, uh, you know, Europeans remember how census data and other types of documents were used 
in World War II. And they also remember the forms of state surveillance conducted by uh, totalitarian state socialist governments in Eastern Europe, and also by um, secret police under far right or fascist governments, uh, including uh, under Mussolini in Italy, uh, the secret police under Salazar in Portugal, uh, the social investigation brigade under Franco in Spain, right? So the, the, that's all uh, uh, within, within, within memory, as it were, and it kind of shapes the, the, the landscape there. And it's actually addressed in GDPR Article 9, which refers to special categories of personal data, which is the, exactly that type of data. And it sets out very careful uh, parameters around how some kinds of sensitive, essentially politically sensitive data uh, should be handled. So uh, we 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 kind of have to have that that history in in our in our minds when we try to understand what's happening in 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 Europe. Uh, but we also need to understand the recent uh, the recent history of big data state um, surveillance. And I'm referring here to things we know from Edward Snowden uh, in 2013 where Facebook and Google and Microsoft and others are, are, are known to exchange data with intelligence agencies in Europe and North America and Anglo Anglophone Australasia. Uh, GCHQ is the government communications headquarters. It's like the British um, spooks, you know, uh, an intelligence uh, agency. And Black Hole is the name of their, what they call their flat data store. Uh, so it's essentially a massive intelligence service data um, repository. And they have various interfaces which interact with black hole, all of which have quite cool names like mutant broth or memory hole or social anthropoid. And there's one called Karma Police, which is obviously named after the radio head song, uh, which is used uh, to do uh, what it says there up on the on the screen, but also to, it, they can use it to conduct pattern of life analysis on individual users to detail when and where people are active on, online. So, um, the there's a form of surveillance there which is not just uh massive like in, incredibly incredibly massive um but also has been used in rather insidious ways so for example gchq uh, mutant broth used gchq data to follow facebook cookies uh and thereby to identify employees at gemalto a company which makes sim cards and they did that because they wanted to get the encryption keys uh, by which SIM cards are, are encrypted. They also attacked the Belgian telecoms company Belgacom uh, in order to conduct what they call man in the middle attacks. So that's where they can kind of get into the smartphone of a target and they can intercept and modify communications between targets, right? So, uh, Given the history of the 20th century in, in Europe that I was just uh, uh, describing, and also given obviously recent and indeed current political events, um, it might be safe to say that we could have good grounds for caution around the kinds of surveillance activity that states uh, have conducted and do uh, conduct, just given the political and economic and ecological context uh, that we're in. So that's a kind of macro kind of picture of what you were sort of, you know, what, what you're in when you're when you're thinking about data, uh, data capture relative to the state and, and state legislation around data capture. So uh, the right to be forgotten, which is described in brackets in the um, uh, in the in the GDPR, uh, the history of, of it is in the droit à l'oubli. Uh, in in French uh, in French law, uh, they they have a, a similar right in in Italy and in the United States it's it's called expungement. Um, so uh, this is what is called common law record relief. Uh, Australia, Canada, the European Union, New Zealand, South Africa, the United Kingdom, and the United States have sealing and expungement processes. Uh, in many jurisdictions, the records of juveniles are automatically sealed or expunged. Uh, at the age of majority, for example, in the United States, that's at around 17 or 18. In the United States, expungement first emerged in the 1940s, um, specifically with respect to um, juvenile records. Uh, expungement also occurs where laws are retrospectively repealed, um, as for example, with the repeal of vice, um, vice 
or morality statutes, such as those criminalizing sexual practices or the supply and possession of cannabis. Uh, there's currently significant momentum in the United States towards what is called clean slate or automatic um, record relief. Uh, there's a reason for that, which is that expungement is a benefit to record bearers, to their families and their communities, and to society at large, right? It, it mitigates many of the collateral consequences of encounters with the criminal justice system. Uh, it lowers recidivism rates, and it increases, it increases the earnings of the formerly justice involved. Uh, but expungement also paradoxically erases the historical record of unjust law and the scale of its effects. Uh, expungement can also compromise the data through which provision for support services is allocated, and importantly in the United States context, through which structural racism in criminal justice and policing becomes documentable and quantifiable. So there's this interesting kind of tension or dynamic uh, between what expungement can do for individuals and between what it can do uh, for society's understanding of itself, and that uh, tension or dynamic kind of foreshadows the limits of erasure, um, as we'll see uh, presently. So why, why is it in, in brackets uh, there? Because of this legend, uh, Costeja Gonzalez, who is the guy, the case was called Google Spain, and it went to the European Court of Justice in 2014. Costeja Gonzalez was a Spanish man, and he wanted uh, links to old newspaper articles about him removed from Google search results. And uh, the Google Spain case predates and sets the scene for the GDPR, even though the GDPR and the right to erasure was in train for a very long time uh, in Europe uh, before the Google Spain case. Uh, now, the reason why I'm, I'm sort of talking about this is because of the slightly peculiar nature of the right that it is, the right to be forgotten. Costeja Gonzalez wanted these links, uh, he wanted Google to remove links in, in search results for his name to uh, an old um, uh, debt recovery uh, sale of property. And uh, there's a, one of the implications of this is that the right to be forgotten appears in this sort of peculiar way. It's, it's sort of like a right with its, uh, with its tail between its legs, if you know what I mean. Because Costeja Gonzalez is a kind of a Trojan horse because you, you're sort of sympathetic to him. So, you know, why would he be hounded by ancient um, records? Uh, but at the same time, it sort of constitutes the right of the data subject as if they require a second chance despite past indiscretions, right? Uh, so, and, and it formulates the right to be forgotten as if it was essentially a reputational one. It's about how other people who use this media might encounter the data subject. Uh, so it casts the right in a weird sort of moral light when it's put in that context about, um, about erasure. So, um so so it, so i'm just going to move this now in, in, into what i'm calling the sociology of the famg right the type of sociology that they that they do the kind of value proposition that they that they have and i, I might just say also roba do tell me if I, I ought to hurry up or or if i'm uh if i start to look like i'm going over time uh so I'm describing this as a sociology because they're generating knowledge about society and, and monetizing it. That's how the big tech oligopolies uh, operate. And the value of the data to them lies at the population level. It's about building profiles and probabilities and predictions. So the value of data in here is in the predictive promise of the social categories that can be inferred from it, right? It's about knowing things about people that they might not know themselves, and it's about predicting what an individual in a given category might think or want just when they want it, or even optimally a little bit before uh, they know that they, they want it. And that's the, that's the promise that companies like Google make to, to advertisers, right? That's the basis of the, uh, the revenue stream. It's about, essentially, it's about building inferential and predictive uh, knowledge. So one of the implications of that is that data is relational, right? Data as a, as a commodity, its value lies in the kind of sociology uh, that a company like Google can, can do with it. Uh, and this is a sort of an echo of what Scarlett was, was saying. 
Uh, but but data, was also, data is also relational in its derivation in, in that it comes from the actions of people interacting with machines and with each other. Uh, it's collectively derived, it's an exhaust of, of common action. Uh, so, uh, or, or it's also, data is also uh, r relational in that inevitably uh, data about an individual uh, can be and will be used as information about their local social context, uh, that is to say geographically and in social network terms. For example, your, your private data on your phone includes your contact list uh, and your Facebook friends and so on. So there isn't really monadic or atomic uh, individual level data in that, in that sense. So you, you have then a kind of a problem of data disempowerment, right? One of the things that the, uh, the sociology of the FAM generates is a kind of epistemic asymmetry where things are known about people, but people don't know what is known about them. And they don't necessarily know how their media environment is being modulated around that, uh, that knowledge. So people lose control over their, uh, over their data, and they also lose control or some kind of understanding about what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, so th that is to say, uh, an exit politics of erasure uh, doesn't address that. The problem of the sociology of the FANG is a governance problem. It's not a rights problem. Uh, and this is actually before you get to problems inside data systems uh, which use machine learning and AI and so on, where it's actually very difficult to pull an individual's data out or to work out how to locate all of an individual's data in an unstructured data set. So um, uh, exit in, in, in that sense, the, you know, the right to erasure seems like a uh, largely passive and a largely negative uh, right. Um, the interest we have in our data is social and it is political because of the way data is social and relational in the way that I was just describing. Uh, and it involves not only our rights individually, but also collectively, but also our interactions with and obligations to one another, given that's how the data is generated. So this is in close to the neighborhood where people start talking about a delete button, where they just say, why can't I just delete it myself? Why do I have to ask somebody else permission? Uh, and also where people start talking about markets in data, you know, why doesn't Facebook just pay all of its users uh, on the basis of the value that they're, they're, they're generating for the company. But neither of those things are really um, solutions to the, the problem that I'm trying to, uh, to get at. And so your, your data is already having an effect on other people, but you're not allowed the social or the moral responsibility or autonomy to have those effects organized in a way that you might want. So the problem is not just that an individual's data is, is appropriated or is used in a sense against them for marketing purposes. Uh, and um, Vil June is a, I found this article actually very helpful. Uh, she's drawing on feminist political theory about recognition. Uh, and the point that is, is kind of being made here is that whether you're in the data set or, or whether you erase yourself from it, you still have not been able to act on or to recognize your relations with, with others as they are evidenced in the data. You haven't been able to achieve mutual recognition with them. And in a sense, the right to erasure thus means that you, what you've actually been given is a right to exacerbate inequality with others. You, you don't get a right to recognize or articulate jointly with other people in the data set what your shared interests might be and what the potential risks of that data might be for you as a group or, or as a society. So whether you opt, act, well, sorry, whether you opt out or you, you stay in, uh, you, you, you don't get to take responsibility for how your actions affect others relative to the context in which your data is being uh, mined. And in fact, even if you do exit, uh, the profile of people just like you is still there and will still, will still act on you. So uh, the idea then would be that datafication is, is kind of exacerbating existing social harms by depriving knowledge of them. Uh, and it's building on and sedimenting categories of differentiation which are already unequal and are used in politically damaging ways. There's an opportunity to cost to datafication uh, in terms of the social and economic ends to which it's oriented, and it constitutes a social harm um, in itself. So for that reason, uh, individual rights are just a peculiar mechanism to try to deal with the sociology of the FAM, right? And we kind of know 
that this is in the minds of the uh, boffins, as it were, in the European Union who are devising these systems. We know that they want to have a run at companies like Google. Uh, and we know that they recognize in some way that wholly privatized datafication is a kind of a moral injury. Uh, so why, why is erasure posited as a solution? You know, why, why, why is that? And so one, one way of thinking about it is that maybe it's a kind of a compliance nudge. Maybe what the European Union is doing is saying, uh, if we sort of require large companies to be able just to provide people's data, even if no individual ever really asks for it, then we can limit uh, datafication or slow it down. Or an, another kind of interpretation, which is the one that Zuboff makes in the Surveillance Capitalism book, is that maybe that's the first salvo in a bigger kind of battle, a bigger legal battle uh, about datafication. Uh, but it seems to still to be a kind of a strange kind of logic because it gives all of the power to the data collector, right? If you want Google to erase your data, you've got to ask them and you don't really know what they, what they, what they do with that, with that question. So uh, another way of kind of formulating what, what I'm saying here is to say that rights, rights are also a technology. Rights are a political and administrative and a discursive technology. So it's really hard to say you're against rights, right? Nobody says, I don't, I don't like those rights and I don't want them. That's a sort of an impossible thing uh, to say. So rights are a very powerful political and administrative technology, but they don't, it doesn't seem like they're going to get at the kind of damage that we're talking about when we're talking about datafication in the way that I'm, uh, I'm describing it. Uh, and the history of expungement, I think, shows that it's not an adequate tool to address the history of the abuse of records uh, by the state, even before we get to uh, entirely privatized uh, datafication. So one way then of, uh, of sort of wrapping things up or, or of trying to put that somewhere is to say the rights, rights are a kind of a discursive and a political and administrative technology but are they the ones that you kind of want? Are they the best ones that you could get to think about technologies that are in the public interest? And um, that's it, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was a fabulous way to, to end your presentation and, and so much to say on that point in particular. I really appreciate the richness of the presentation about datafication rights as a technology, erasure as a practical activity, and the importance of the historical perspective from that European perspective that really permeates data protection um, to the embeddedness within state corporate surveillance contexts, and also tying to the predictive capabilities and knowledge as aligned with Scarlett's presentation. Um, what's really interesting is that the relational aspects which somewhat render Article 17 insufficient given the focus of, of the individual. We will return to your talk in a moment, Andrew, but I will move on now to our third presentation. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our final speaker for today, Professor Marin Janssen. Marin Janssen is a full professor in ICT and governance in the Technology Policy and Management Faculty of the Delft University of Technology. Um, he's particularly interested in situations in which multiple public and private organizations seek to collaborate, where ICT plays an important enabling role, where organizational realities and political wishes constrain socio-technical solutions, and where there are also various ways to proceed um, Professor Janssen is the co-editor-in-chief of Government Information Quarterly, is the president of the Digital Government Society, chair of the IFIP Working Group 8.5 in ICT and Public Administration, and also the conference chair for IFIP uh, eGov. Among his many achievements, Professor Janssen was ranked as one of the leading e-government researchers in surveys in, 20, in 2009, 2014, and 2016, was one of the 100 most influential people in digital government worldwide in 2018 and 2019, and has also published over 600 referee publications with a Google H index of 80 and in excess of 25,000 citations. Professor Janssen's Pitt Colloquium presentation is on open government, more than transparency, and we'll now hear from Professor Janssen. Thank you for your nice uh, introduction, uh, Roba, and thank you for uh, having me. I'm uh, delighted to uh, talk about uh, public interest uh, technology. And personally, I love technology. 
because technology can be used for the good. It can be used for improving our society, for tackling our ground uh, challenges uh, in a variety of way, but it's always different than we expect. Eh? That's why we had uh, also in this series, uh, uh, the discussions about the ethical issues and the presentations about that. What I want to talk about uh, today is about open government. And open government is a kind of reaction to that the government is acting on its own and it, the, the public doesn't know what's happening. And so in one way or another, the government has to be uh, open to the public and to create some level of transparency. But it's more than transparency because transparency alone might not be enough. Furthermore, we are never sure what is meant with uh, transparency. And I prefer to talk about some level of transparency to instead of to using the term transparency. So we can increase the transparency, but we might never have full transparency. I will come back to you uh, uh, those slides. And there are a couple of uh, elements that are very uh, important and need to be considered. First, take a very simple and traditional uh, example. I think all countries have this. I just took them from the uh, UK. It's already a bit uh, old. This is the open spending. And some people say from, oh, this is a really nice example of open government because you can see what is spent, how it is spent. You can zoom in and how much money is spent on health, how much money is spent on education, and you can start influencing uh, it. So people think from, wow, this is transparent because I know now how my budget is spent. But try to zoom in. To which level do you know your budget is spent? If it's spent on help, do you also know what kind of help it is spent? How much the emergency unit uh, will get? So the question always is from how far do we go and what could let we show? And if we show all the details, what happened, you can say from, oh, we have some high level of transparency, but you might be lost in the details. If it's too high level, we might not sure anymore if, uh, uh, yeah, if it's really going on and it might just give a direction, but we might not have sufficient data. So that's why it's so difficult to create some level of transparency. When you talk about open government, uh, open government, it's about mechanisms for ensuring effective uh, public oversight. Yeah, and that's what you want to do. And for that, you want to need the society, the public, and they look inside, uh, inside the government to take a look at it. And it contains a couple of elements. The first element that is very important, and it's in the name openness. And openness means that yeah, you open the black box, and right? you can see inside the black box, and you see what is uh, going on, and then you can take a next step. Often the next step is once you open it, the black box, that's transparency. And you already know it, some level of transparency. Very important because what you open is also de determines what you see. And from if you want to look outside, look outside your window, window over here, when I look outside, I can see and it looks transparent. But I see a couple of trees, I see some buildings, but I don't know what is next to it. So that's also with transparency. It's on the eye of the beholder and who, who opens the data determines also the transparency. Once we have some level of transparency, we can talk about accountability. And accountability is about uh, keeping persons responsible for its actions or its inactions, eh? lack of actions. For so why did you act in a certain way? Why did you make a decision in a certain way? Eh? Or why didn't you do a, uh, the making a decision in a certain way? And accountability can also be at, a, at all levels. Eh? It can be about a certain permit that is granted or not granted, but it can also about the policy, a new policy concerning the energy transition and the use of solar energy or something like that. So it can be very detailed about individual level, but it can also be at the aggregate level. Once we have accountability, we often talk about one of the elements and that's called participation or engagement. Huh? Well, just opening data, well, if nobody uses it, there will be no transparency and also no accountability. So you need some level of participation. People who start using the data, look inside it, make use of it, and they start also often discussing in it. And nice examples of participation that goes 
completely outside the government. So people start discussing with each other and then they have renewed insights and then they come back to the government to ask them for the accountability. Participation is essential uh, ingredient. And often the reason for starting open government is to increase trust, uh, trust of society in the government. But you can imagine that something else might happen when you open the black box, when you make it transparent and you help people accountable and you see that things are not going that well. That's why we need accountability eh, to improve our setting. It might be that trust doesn't go up, but trust might go down because people see what's really happening over here. If it's a black box, you can't see the problems. If it's a white box or a gray box, you open it a little bit, you can see the problems. So often we assume that there's some relationship between openness and trust and that trust will increase. But in contrary to the common belief, often trust doesn't go up, but might even go down to the uh, open government. Doesn't mean we don't need open government. Of course, we need open government. And it's also temporary often. First, you see the problems. Then you have the participation, the engagement. You can start with addressing the problems. And at the end, trust can go up. So it might be on the long term, but think about the effects and uh, uh, what you're focused uh, on. So about the elements of the open government. A transparency uh, is often what uh, uh, Ricardo Mateus, uh, one of my uh, PhD uh, candidates, uh, is called uh, uh, the window theory, is about opening the window. And you see here a window, the window is closed, you can't see uh, inside, you can only see the bricks uh, in the walls. And what you want to do is you want to create some level of transparency. And what do you, how do you do it? By combining data together. Eh? Only then you can create uh, transparency. It's never a single source eh, of uh, uh, data, it's always combining various sources uh, of data. And providing access to the uh, data, people can start analyzing in making all kinds of conclusions and you might look at uh, what's the pollution near your own area where you're living in uh, you can uh, look at uh, where's the origin of the pollution or something like that that kind of data but it can also be budget data we talked about there's a variety of data and all kinds of elements uh, that are part uh, of it and once we create some transparency we open the window look at the bright sunny weather outside every people is happy and transparency is uh, intuitive very appealing and everybody wants transparency and most people i talk about wants uh, transparency but transparency is also a concept that needs to be implemented and translated and once you translate it into the operations you get into those discussions yeah? oh what happens if i open privacy sensitive information oh, oh you don't want to have that level of transparency what uh, what about all the type of data so at a high level often we all agree we need transparency but at the implementation level when we look at the operations and specific data we might not uh, uh, like it so everybody likes transparency but not about themselves in short so think about that and that makes it also a difficult uh, trade off. And that's why we need also to have a certain view on the world. And what you see over here is instead of the bright sunny uh, uh, air, uh, we see clouds. And currently it's here cloudy in the, uh, it, this is correct what I'm seeing over here. And what you see is you have some level of transparency. So you can see some things that are happening, but you might not have all the details. And that's all, also the information asymmetry that is between those eh, who know what's really happening in the black box eh, inside the building and what's happening outside the building, outside uh, uh, the black box. When you look at it, you have less data. You have less information you will never know what's exactly happened inside but you might have sufficient uh, data and that's what in the, in the accountability area one is saying yeah, for, for accountability you might not need all data but you need some level of uh, data and sufficient data to ensure that you can help people accountable so you don't need all the in and outs it's the same with transparency we don't need all the in and outs to have complete transparency because complete transparency would be very expensive imagine that you go to your uh, president or prime minister and you will follow him all day in all meetings that's complete uh, transparency 
you don't want that to happen. You don't have time uh, for that. So what you want to know is what are the main decisions and what happened uh, uh, over there. What you do in general is that we think that more data results in transparency and more trust. But think about it, more data can result into a huge information overload, all kinds of sources. We don't know the data quality of those sources. So the more data you have, the less transparency you might have and also the less trust you might have because it's like, yeah, you see some clouds and you get more and more uh, clouds and you don't see the sun anymore uh, due to all those uh, clouds. So that's also the difficulty with uh, transparency and to create data into uh, transparency in, uh, in this case. And what we are doing then, in fact, and I always take this picture to have a basic understanding, is what, what we're doing for creating those kinds of um, understanding for transparency is we take all kinds of data that's often unstructured and we start structuring that. Think about this, this presentation. How is this uh, structured data? Well, you can look at the keywords. You can look at the title. That's the structure. Of course, some unstructured part, and you have to watch the video. And we have also the move from closed to open data. Does it mean that it has to be opened for all? No, it doesn't mean it has to be opened for all. You have to open it for a certain group. It could be that you open some data as a government for the accountability office, that the accountability office is able to look at the accountability and they do the job. Sometimes the public might be interested, but they don't have the resources or they don't have the ability to look at it. And not everybody has a PhD in uh, accountability. At least I don't have a PhD in accountability. Think about that in that way. And then we move to something what we call all linked open statistical data. Eh? Why is linked so important? Because we connect all data together. And if we link it together, then it's easy to connect. And in, in the ideal situation, we can ask a question. Eh? What is the amount of budget spent on avoiding pollution in my area? What's the source of the pollution in my area? So instead of that, you push the data to you, you try to ask questions and you focus on the questions on the need. So you try to reverse what is going on. Uh, and that's also why those technologies are so important because they can reverse the game, what's happening over here. And you can ask questions and then you get the answers to your questions. Instead, you get a huge data overload. And that's why uh, uh, data ranking is very important and the type of uh, uh, ranking. And this is the famous uh, um, ranking of uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, eh? the five stars uh, model over there. And yeah, if data is uh, hidden in a PDF, it's one star. star. If it's two stars, if in Excel, because you can start manipulating it a little bit, and it's a CSV file, then uh, you get three stars, RDF, yeah, that's a, a tool to uh, link data together and then we can manipulate uh, data, the resource data fra uh, framework. Then um, uh, we are able to give it four stars and in the ideal situation, we have linked open data, LOD, then we have five stars. Because I talked about that, if we link the data together, then we can start asking questions and then we know what it is. RDF ensures for the semantics eh, that we have and uh, ensure that we have basic understanding and linked data is that we can ask questions and the data sources are, are uh, connected to uh, each other. But yeah, what's the case? Often data is not opened as linked open data. We are already quite happy if it's Excel, uh, Excel uh, spreadsheet or it's a, a CSV file or something uh, like, like that. So it's often basic, but we have to move to the right to have it uh, really focused uh, on it. And yeah, of course, we did some uh, research uh, on it eh? and often, yeah, People say from, oh, we have linked open data, but in fact, they didn't have linked open data. So technology enables a lot, but we're not using it uh, yet. That's also uh, some of the questions. And what kind of challenges uh, do we encounter now? Well, if we have a haystack, huh? well, we can conclude that finding the right data is like the needle in the haystack. We're not able to find the right data. The first question is, where is the data? Where's the open data portal? 
Uh, often we have multiple open data portals. Oh no, each city has an open data portal. Oh, departments within the city have an open data portal. You see, it gets more difficult. Then the question is, who owns it? Uh, who has the data? If you're not able to find it, sometimes it's not released. Who can I ask for it? And once you have the data, what's the quality of the data? Are you sure that it has the right quality and the right format? Then how the data can be linked? Then visualization is also needed and having a user-centric view on it. Eh? If you have just plain data, well, nobody makes sense uh, of it. Eh? You need to uh, have high manipulation. You need a data scientist, somebody with those kind of uh, background. And you can't expect that from the public. Then the focus on public value creation. Yeah, well, the whole seminar is about uh, public values and creation and those kinds of things. Very difficult to, uh, to do. Then how can bias in the data be avoided? Because what often happens, and that's what we saw at the beginning, the spending of uh, data, is that the people who open the data, deter they determine what you can see. And for sure, it's biased. They will ensure that you see the good things and how to spend, and that you might not see the things you shouldn't see. So there's always bias in uh, data. And that means also you have to think about how data can be used to address a societal problem. And then the question is, is transparency created or a predefined view on the world is created? Excuse me for my Dutch <laughs> in it, I speak double Dutch. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, how do you do this? And this might like look like a simple problem, but it's a very complex uh, problem. We have many technologies come together and many ethical and public value uh, discussions also come uh, together. And that's why we have a trade off. And it might even uh, be difficult, more difficult. I, I like to uh, show this uh, example about open agriculture uh, data. And the Netherlands is below the sea level. You might know that uh, almost uh, two thirds below the sea level in one way or another, depending on how, how high the field is. And we have a lot of uh, agriculture. And all those farmers, they do their own agriculture. But we have, they are satellites. And satellites, they have a lot of information about the soil about the temperature over time, about the use of nitrogen, about the water quality uh, that is part uh, of it. But you can imagine that farmers don't have access to it. Maybe a very big farmer might be able uh, to do it, but most of them, they don't. So what did the Dutch government do? They said, well, we have those data, we will open it. We will pay for it and we will ensure that it will be open for the public. But we need also to ensure that it will be used. You can't expect that farmers will look at those data and uh, analyze that. Eh? They are not data scientists. So there were intermediaries that results in the use of the data. They will make sense of the data, analyze it, visualize uh, the data. And then once they do it, it's open data. They can provide all kinds of services uh, to it. For example, what is the right moment of... Uh, uh, planting new uh, new things on, on the land or fertilizing or something uh, like that. Uh, they try to collect the collection of services and that results in the better use of the land and they can use it also uh, to improve their revenues in that way by better use it and it can result in a more efficient and sustainable agriculture. So that's uh, why it's so uh, important. So this is maybe a non-typical example that we uh, took over here, but it shows how value can be created and societal benefits from data, because we want to have sustainability in agriculture. Huh? One of the UN uh, goals, of course, uh, related to sustainability on the long term and the environment and what you want. There's some transparency over there and you help the people. But somebody has to make an investment, in this case, the Dutch government, and you need companies, intermediaries, to start using the data. And at the beginning, there were also incentives for intermediaries to make sure that the data could be uh, used and do it. Yeah, and what I think is happening, and you saw it also in this uh, example, is that the whole governance and the relationship between citizens, businesses, politicians, public administration, it's all shifting. 
look at what's uh, just happened over here. It's not the government that, that that's taking the lead and saying that something should be uh, done, but they're creating a kind of yeah incentives of the possibilities for sustainable agriculture. Uh, uh, the citizens get empowered. They start also influence the politicians with the data and by creating some kind of uh, transparency. So the balance in this system, uh, uh, in the, the, the whole governance, is uh, changing over there. And what's often happening is that yeah, citizens and companies, they get more empowered. And once they get more empowered, they will also do things for the good. Eh? That they're quite happy to contribute uh, often uh, to it eh? on the conditions, of course, that they don't need huge investments and they can also profit from, from it uh, from themselves. So the whole system and the way we treat public administration is changing. Because in the past, we had those policy makers, eh? those policy makers were in their ivory towers, uh, they uh, they had all the data. They make the decisions. They they uh, they provide recommendations to the politicians, and the politicians look at it and could only say yes, eh? because it's quite hard to give uh, uh, to oppose uh, data when you have a, a policy uh, report in it. So by opening and creating transparency, we have all kinds of uh, shift in the uh, in the governance and uh, the part of it. And we need also new uh, new ways of uh, arranging the institutions. Uh, for that. Uh, also think about uh, that data might be much uh, easier, uh, much more difficult uh, to do, and that things dependent on each other, because you can use also data to say from, oh, we should do this, and then somebody else is coming, no, no, look, I found another data set, and we should do that, we should go the other way, and then somebody else is looking from the data, no, no, I found that we should this. So we get also into the discussions and the discourse about what are the right uh, directions. And of course, it can be uh, misused of people saying from you see my point is proven in this way, but more important is the engagement eh, that we start the deliberating about what are the possible uh, ways. And that we so also should ensure that we have the participation and the engagement, eh, that we're not looking for a single answer, but providing the insight and take the citizens and companies with you because else you will lose them and they will only listen to the uh, answer uh, to it. And then you think, ah, I know now how, how to do it. Well, there's no best information arrangement. From it's dependent on uh, how, if you want to, to arrange this from, it's dependent on the architecture. It's not, we need the platform or a decentralized architecture or whatever, the various ways uh, to shape it. And also aspects like trust, power and also the involvement of organizations, they shape not only how the architecture is used, but also the governance of the information exchange and what is possible. And we know examples in which the data is opened and in similar examples, data is not opened. So there are a lot of aspects that play uh, a role. And the, yeah, the disappointing part as a researcher, maybe we always try to find the best way of arrangement which is really context specific and you have to really go into detail to understand it. So there's no best uh, arrangement that's all the best in all situations. You really should know the situation at hand. And things getting more difficult uh, right now. That's why I like to show uh, this uh, example. This is the city of uh, Den Haag, eh, near the beach, near the North Sea, uh, over there. Delft is here at the bottom uh, uh, of this uh, picture. And they have a lot of decisions made, thousands of pages uh, each year. And yeah, well, as a citizen, you're not able to keep track on all those decisions and on the text. So what they have nowadays in uh, almost every city in the Netherlands is a tool they use based on machine learning that reverses it. If you're interested in certain topic, interested in certain neighborhood, they will push the information to you, just a few large, not as complex uh, documents. And the colors in this picture show that small regulation. This is uh, in the middle, but the Nike is here. This is the city centers, a lot of regulations, a lot of information, but some other area that are lighter, that's less regulations each year. So they have less information overload. So they try to get into citizens' uh, engagements and involvement by making it very simple for them to find and know the situation by pushing it to them instead of the traditionally uh, pool. 
And a lot of new technology can create uh, insight in it. And I think that results into transparency. And that's why it's also more than transparency huh, in the title of this uh, uh, presentation. And another part uh, uh, that is highly discussed is the data collaborative. We need to collaborate together on the data because not only the government has a lot of data, but citizens start to measure a lot of data and companies have a lot of data. And what's the idea behind the data collaborative is that they start collaborating together, start sharing the data for the good, and then we come at better insights and uh, looking at it. That's the concept of data collaborative, but that means also you have to right parties uh, uh, involved. And as a recommendation, if you want to use such a data collaborative, don't start with developing your own infrastructure or platform, because that results in yet another infrastructure. Try to use what already exists and uh, try to collaborate uh, based on that. And that's why data collaboratives is very important. So it's not about open public data, but it's also data from citizens and companies. And nowadays, as example for pollution me measurement, a lot of people, they don't trust the government. They uh, buy a device and not very expensive, uh, 10, 20 euros, the euro, uh, one euro is uh, one US dollar, uh, uh, approximately. And they can start measuring the pollution themselves. And if you have thousands of citizens, you have thousands of measurement uh, points. So you have an immense amount of data that can be used uh, for that uh, purpose. And one of the final uh, things I want to talk about is that often we talk about opening data and we just talk about one part of the whole life cycle. We have to look at the whole life cycle that is relevant. So we have to think about the whole data creation. In this case, we talk about data cubes. Data cubes is when you have multi-dimensional data. You, you, you uh, connect all kinds of data together. It's not about only uh, one part of it, but it's the, uh, the from the beginning, the collecting, processing of the data, the uh, opening of the data, the publishing of the data in this case in the, uh, in, the cube, in the cubes, but also about the engagement cycle, the remaining cycle in part of it, in which you show the data, you provide incentives for starting using uh, the data, and we have to research also the in incentive that the public start analyzing the cubes, but maybe also policymakers should help the public if they have a certain questions to help them to process uh, the data, to to communicate the results and then the cycle starts over and over again so uh, you have to look at from that point of view many iterations many uh, cycles that are part uh, of it and then you get some uh, things like this this is an example of the flemish uh, government with that that about the environmental uh, data and they look at from a citizens civil servants and company point of view they can uh, ask questions with the data so citizens want to know the emissions in the neighborhood the civil civil servants want to know what is uh, reported and uh, how does it comply with uh, uh, the law and regulations and how can we uh, inspect it and maybe a co company wants to compare the emissions and uh, with similar companies and look for best practices and try to reduce the emissions something like that so we can have a win 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 situation for all <coughs> so that's a way to look also at it at the different stakeholder perspectives so we have different insights uh, from the data to wrap it up uh, uh, opening in more and more uh, data but users looks legs behind we want to have more than transparency yeah? it's not about transparency but it's about doing something uh, with the uh, data we need uh, uh, to look uh, at the data and we need also to open more data and that means also that the traditional relationship between the government and the public is changing and really with data collaborative it can be that companies the public and governments are working in such a way together that the whole relationship is changed and who, who provides the expertise who provides the insights there's a huge need for new uh, type of uh, governance uh, models to collaborate, to share it. There's a lot of insights needed for uh, how to deal with those technology. I give you some uh, examples, eh? but those might be the easy examples or uh, the, the examples that can serve as uh, some kind
kind of uh, uh, novelty, but we have to do it also in other uh, settings. And there's so many uh, factors that are part uh, of it that we are quite struggling with understanding it. This is a very complex uh, landscape where we need uh, much insight in it. And I didn't go into transparency literature. I didn't uh, go into all the open data literature. There's a lot around uh, over, over there that we can uh, delve delve into it so we need a lot of research we already know a, a lot of doing it but we are not there yet let me know if there are any questions katina i think you would agree with me that we were treated to excellent presentations today and i've had the good fortune of hearing scarlett and andrew speak both formally and also in research presentations covering so many themes so many rich themes as i said previously um, and i'm sure their presentations have prompted some reflections on your part, um, some questions even. Uh, before inviting um, any audience questions, I would like to turn to you for some initial thoughts, some reflections and some thoughts um, that you have, the questions that you have, excuse me. Well, we've sure been graced by all of you today, um, Rebe yourself included. I know uh, yourself, Scarlett and Andrea are working on a very important project, many to come, I hope. And uh, it's wonderful to see auxiliary themes um, coming from that research. Uh, I know uh, tight-knit groups actually uh, hit very high uh, when they're working closely together over a long time. So it's wonderful to see that collaboration and we are the fortunate recipients of that here at the Pitt Colloquium uh, at ASU. Um, I also want to say uh, they were probably two of the most succinct talks. Uh, Professor Marin also, as we just heard, a wonderful foray into open government, Scarlet Social Security and its size and the parameters and the anal analytics and the mining and the vulnerable communities. And Andrew, uh, with the right of erasure uh, and the right to be forgotten um, and the GDPR and its importance and that key point, which you have so eloquently positioned of we can't have it both ways. We seem not to be able to win as consumers any which way we look at it, even if data um, uh, is in our awareness and how it's being used. And even if it's not, we're sort of, a, it's a double whammy on both sides. Um, Roba, I have some questions, um, if we have time. Um, the first question I've Please got go to ahead. Thank you so much. Um, the first question I have is to Scarlett. And um, wow, Scarlett, um, you broke it down so clinically. And um, we were talking about discriminating against the discriminated. Um, I have a question in the chat which talked about is this double discrimination or discrimination squared? What's the real effect to vulnerable communities when things go wrong with government systems? Um, yeah, listen, it's a great question. Um, the, the tricky thing about this is often you can't really tell right at the end what's the cause of the harm. So, for example, if you're a social security lawyer and I still have a lot of contact, even though I'm not um, currently practicing because I work in uh, on the board of a legal center that does this, often you get this kind of decontextualized case at the end. So the lawyer themselves, the recipient. So you might have a review that's questionable, a debt that's questionable, et cetera, et cetera, but you're not even sure where it's come from. So the kind of the one of the issues is the the chain of kind of decision making is very opaque. So these systems aren't fully automated, unlike RoboDebt, ro ro RoboDebt, which was much more automated. So you have you do have people you know they're not they're not the decision there's a there's a system and then people use that system so it's really difficult to figure out exactly what um you know the the individual outcomes are for individual recipients what i can say is it overall produces a picture of systematic targeting of already vulnerable people so that targeting usually looks like quite intrusive um review processes that are arguably unnecessary or if not just um unfairly distributed so that there's they're targeted and no one else is targeted or targeted much more than their um, their counterparts on on social security especially you see a really real distinction between say how aged pensioners for example are treated compared to the unemployed and um, uh, women primarily women so about 97 percent of women on this payment for social for um, single parent pension effectively. So we see those payments sort of continually singled out. What I think that that's very much a kind of, it, it's not a complete break with past practice. So it's a continuation of a pattern that was already occurring. What I think these systems do is just propel, automate them and kind of give them some more legitimacy in the past than, than, than they were. So before you had to say, oh, we're gonna target single mothers. 
or we're going to target the unemployed and that still happens you still see that happen in policy where they're saying oh we're, we're you know the unemployed they need to meet more obligations they have higher you know standards we want them to meet because of these reasons and therefore we're going to target them in this way so it still happens but when we do these other compliance um, activities with these tools, we can use the, the kind of mask where we're putting it in a neutral language of risk and distancing ourselves from actually having to say we're targeting single mothers. And that in itself creates a kind of a different problem, a different way of targeting people. So definitely not a full break from the past, different kinds of problems, really difficult to pinpoint precise kind of outcomes in the sense of but what I see is a general picture of, of, of more targeting, which means more intrusive, more frequent inquiries into these people's lives. Um, and that obviously has a kind of flow on effect. And, you know, it, it also can be a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So if you're going to keep targeting those people, you're going to find more and then you're going to keep targeting them. So it can sort of just continue on indefinitely. Um, so that's kind of, I, I hope that answers your question, but it doesn't really have... Um, sometimes in the challenge of this research is sometimes you miss the concrete um, and I can certainly saw that in my interview is missing the concrete um, outcomes of their work. It sure does that answers my question and I think uh, Robert may have a related question I'm not sure. I do actually I was just thinking as Scarlett was mentioning the distancing mechanism or aspect uh, uh, Scarlett, you mentioned in your talk categories of customer data, and I often wonder, and we've spoken to this point, uh, all of us on this call, in fact, um, about the issue potentially being in the categorization of a citizen as a customer, providing the potential for customer work, which Katina and I and our team have spoken about in the context of an editorial recently. So what this does is, in addition to the distancing that you're speaking about, although yours is slightly different, um, uh, it places the responsibility on the citizens in the guise of self-service and in the interest of efficiency. In your opinion, and based on some of the aspects you spoke about, about the human, the values that you've spoken to, to at least Andrew and myself in the past, about do you think we need some kind of reframing that centres the human as more than just a customer? So is this partly the problem here? And do you have any thoughts you'd be happy to share? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I certainly think it's part of the context in which this is enabled to happen. So the kind of introduction of the word customer is quite a clear decision that happened in 1997 in Australia with the introduction of um, Centrelink. So there was a rebranding. So the rebranding it became a kind of, it, it, you know, since been re-bureaucratised in a funny way, but at the time it was a kind of creating a self-service one-stop shop that was a, a, a independent to government that you would sort of the government agencies would contract Centrelink to provide human services. And the, the, the people on benefits, which were called different things, sometimes customers, but not exclusively prior to that, all became customers and everyone had to use it. So it was a policy. Um, and they explicitly used the word Centrelink so you couldn't shorten it. So it didn't sound like the DHS or the, you know, whatever departments usually sound like. So it was a, an explicit break with that practice. And, and as part of that was a reconceptualization as the person in receipt of welfare as a as a customer that apparently has choice. But of course, uh, you know, if they're this kind of person apparently shopping for human services. But because the system is so targeted, it's so bureaucratic, it's so uh, highly means tested, it's, there's not really a great deal of choice. And it, maybe the choice is not to claim a payment and not pay your rent and claim a payment. doesn't really sound much like a choice to me. <laughs> so certainly, you know, there might be a very basic choice, but whether or that's a genuine choice is a real question. So it kind of seems to um, play down the stakes. So what we're talking about here is not doing some internet shopping. We're talking about accessing income that could be the difference between people feeding their family that week or not. OK, so the, the kind of concept of customer underpins all this that does really reduce or, or seemingly like the symbolic power of that is to reduce the stakes of what's what's at play here. Um, and so if we get this wrong, if we target people, it, it's not just about people not getting the right shoes, you know, and listen, that could be a problem too. right? I'm not saying that's not a problem, but it's a very different problem of being of getting a twenty thousand dollar debt incorrectly or even if you don't get the debt of being identified as suspicious and your life investigated. And what it, it is, your life investigated because all these investigations, they're not about, you know, what you did outside. It's about who lives with you, 
what your job is like. Did your kids attend school? Uh, you know, how many children you have? Are they actually living with you all the time? Did you split up with your partner? So the, by their nature, the questions are intimate as well. So even if nothing happens, there's zero debt the investigation or review process itself can be a punishment. So in that sense, I don't like the concept of customer because I think it's accurate, but it also has a role to play in um, downplaying the, what, what's at stake. And that I think can sanitize the process and help that distance to, uh, you know, to, to become, you know, it sort of facilitates the distance. That's certainly a systemization of harm. I think that was the term you used to express, Scarlett. It's actually a shocking term. Uh, particularly because vulnerable members of the community don't have a fixed address mainly and don't know where they're living, don't know how many people were in their house and don't know how many kids they're actually looking after at once sometimes. Um, we have evidence to suggest that the RoboDebt scandal actually did cause uh, quite a substantive amount of a number of uh, suicides based on wrong debt collection letters and that will uh, fill, infiltrate out into the public soon. Uh, in a bigger way. I know that there was a committee hearing announcement just yesterday uh, on further evidence of that OCI, uh, I won't call it a bungle, but disaster uh, and disastrous for the human, for the end, 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 end user. You know, as you said, customers uh, buy things. No one's buying anything here. They're just, uh, yeah, they're not buying anything. Um, I, I have a, another question for you, Scarlett. Um, I'm sorry, Robo, I think we're gonna go a little bit over time. Uh, 452 million interaction points is excessive. I've always taught sensitive data, whether physical biometrics or behavioral biometrics, uh, have to have a specific use. You just can't create them willy nilly without saying, I oh, will use it for this reason. And if you don't use it, you ditch it. In this instance, can we say that the Australian federal government may be at risk of uh, breaching its own Australian Privacy Act? Would you go that far? And do they have any data policies or data mining policies that are transparent enough for us to get through? Listen, I, it's certainly something that requires a bit more thought before I give you a conclusive answer on this. What I will say, though, is that the way that the system operates currently um, is to have a lot of carve-outs for compliance because it's to enforce um, potential breaches of the law. So in that sense, it can be a kind of that there are sort of le legislative provisions that enable um, the this kind of work to uh, go on. But also systems like including RoboDebt that was found to be unlawful for, you know, it doesn't, these don't have legal basis, right? So they just operate in the bureaucracy, <laughs> right? So it, that makes it challenging in itself because even the establishment of them is sort of without legal basis. And that's a real um, criticism of them um, for a range of reasons, including being able to sort of understand that they exist, to start with, see what they do, and then also to ensure that they're, uh, fulfilling existing legislation, which may be inadequate, but at least fulfilling the, what the, the legislation and principles that we have. So including in the Privacy Act, there's quite a lot of carve outs for sort of enforcement activities, which includes protecting public revenue. Um, so it can be often seen as an exception. Um, and this is often why we see these kinds of systems proliferate in terms of fraud and compliance, because there's that, that, kind, of, that kind of carve out. In terms of actually using things like mouse clicks, like that, that kind of um, digital welfare state data. It's not currently used. They would have had to at least add that to their privacy notice. Um, but I can't see initial, and this is very much an initial, I would have, I'd have to do a proper legal analysis of this and get some, ex, you know, some expertise from a privacy uh, lawyer down the hall <laughs> here, but that I can't see any reason why it couldn't, because it's a legislative goal of social security to minimise um, so it's literally a legislative goal to minimise sort of incorrect payments. Eligibility and verification review are core business. So they're not sort of, you know, it's not ancillary. At the moment, the privacy policies around that sort of welfare, digital welfare state data is about improving the services. But I can't see any particular barriers to them extending that at this stage, subject to some further legal analysis. Well... Charlotte, what a, what a response. I know uh, I, every person I've ever spoken to doesn't want to reach that uh, telephone line of, of doom, and, doom and waiting. You know, talk about distance. You couldn't be more distant. But yes, if they're relying on our voice prints uh, as evidence to log us in without that special password, then we might be waiting for some time. Uh, it's a very interesting conundrum. Uh, I might move over to towards Andrew. And Andrew, I have one question. Um, I don't know which one to ask you first. Um, 
maybe that question about data production. I don't know which one you want to answer. I've got two in the chat. One is on um, the GDPR as hard law, and you mentioned rights as a form of technology. With I, I thought that was superb. Um, but we also look at rights as soft law. Sometimes if it's not legally binding, it's there to sort of place soft pressure on big tech, you know, to comply. Um, soft law measures can include standards, policies, processes, guidelines. And now if you're telling us, hmm, rights are a type of technology, might they extend to applying pressure on FAM and to comply with data protection? protection? And what's your advice um, regarding the unrelentless data production there and uh, will this implode in the future? What's your prediction? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, thanks. I, I, I don't. I'm. I don't know, Katina. I think that I imagine that it's. It, it is intended to do that. I, I imagine that the GDPR, that the, the the erasure there, is intended to essentially slow down the fam, right? It's like uh, slow down datafication, and and slow it down as a privatized activity essentially. So for example, you cannot ask, there are numerous types of state agencies that you can't ask to have your data erased, most notably the police. Uh, so um, uh, I think it's intended to slow down privatized uh, uh, data, data collection, which is essentially un un unwarranted and is a kind of a, uh, a frenzy. Uh, but I, I don't think it will do, I don't think it will do, I don't think it will do very much. I, I, I don't think it will actually, and, and in fact, I don't think technically, I, I don't think it's actually possible for it to do very much. I think we're already sort of past it. So it's a very, if it's an opening salvo, it's a very modest one. Uh, so, uh, and in terms of what, what to do, it, it's sort of interesting to think about what, what Marin was saying about transparency and, and open government and, you know, o opacity and who can who can see who and why, you know, what are the kind of visibility rights that different players have? Uh, and I, I initially sort of thought that maybe you can just make arguments about uh, transparency and about data commons and um, uh those kinds of uh th those kinds of arguments but, but actually i don't think that will work i don't think that really cuts it and i think that people have to make arguments which are much more explicit about uh about opacity and illegibility so not just that i i could ask permission to leave the data set but that i i could ask to just be illegible uh you know to just not either to not go into the data set or to be obfuscated somehow as i as i pass as I pass through it. So I think that's, I mean, in some ways it's about, uh, I mean, like you were saying, Scarlett, it's, it's because it's possible to capture the data, they just capture it and then they, they do things with it. So it, in a way it's, um, it's not a technological problem. It's a, it's a set of political problems. And it's, it's in, in the case of the FAMG, it's problems about um, the business model. You know, it's, it's a business model that develops um, in, in a weird way, in a slightly kind of Wild West regulatory uh, regime, and then pr uh, privacy law, which is, you know, built up on, on other kinds of technologies, like the archive, uh, turns to it and goes, oh, wait, that, that suddenly happened, and we need to think and talk about that now. I might pass on to Roba. I, I can hog this, the stage with questions with both of you, but I'll pass on to Roba. Thank you, Katina. Thank you, Andrew. I think you're quite right and and in terms of the technology not necessarily being the core issue here and more referring to the business model and the implications there and I know there is traction in the research community in that particular space but it does require what we believe would be a transdisciplinary approach certainly we've spoken about the need for interdisciplinarity um I think we're almost out of time but I'm curious to ask you a question about um about your book Andrew because the presentation that you uh, delivered today is one chapter, I believe you said chapter three in your forthcoming book, which, as I said earlier, is provisionally titled Destruction of Documents. I'm wondering if you could share any additional thoughts or insights from your book relevant to the topics raised today or in today's session, pointing perhaps to um, some of what you perceive to be the solutions to the role of government um, and just any other chapters you think um, we might be interested in. I'm sure all of them are great, but in terms of coverage, perhaps what you intend to cover. 
Sure. Um, so in, in a way, I'm, I'm interested in the history of like I'm situating erasure relative to disposition, right, to uh, d uh, document disposition processes, both as ordinary conventional processes in terms of people figuring out what goes into an archive and what doesn't or, you know, what is what is pro probity in records management. Uh, but also in, in terms of emergencies where people have felt that they had to destroy documents either because they wanted to cover something up or because they thought that they would come to nefarious ends uh, if they didn't. So that broad kind of uh, context around administrative media and, and its handling, and that's connected, I think, to, to political and social ideas around remembering and forgetting and, um, and the ideas that we were kind of talking about today about who gets to see what and and why and to what ends is that that, that visibility put uh, and I find as I go on the sort of the longer I the longer I do it uh, the more it, it becomes about um, political imperatives and and political essentially about forms of political power which are often obfuscated uh, and so one of the kind of, in a way, what one of the tragedies is how we're so well socialized to think about uh, administration as an ordinary and normal process that we, it, we're in a way going to sort of take it for granted that, oh, look at this technically neutral and objective or scientific process, which is going to just do something sensible. Or, of course, uh, it, it would be very strange if the government were handling my, my personal data in an irregular way and so we're, we're sort of trusting large systems that in a way are, are innately un, unreliable and uh, to some extent un, untrustworthy and even if we feel safe many other people are, are not uh, going to be safe and so in, in a way you end up going two ways I think and one way you end up going is towards um, illegibility and talking about ways to just uh, not just exit, but ways to not be seen, uh, opacity, and that's one way that you you end up going. And and I think lots of people do kind of end end up going that way. And the other way I think that people end up going is towards greater regulation, and for, you know further investment in these systems. And perhaps everyone you know people have to do a bit of both, or people have to decide what they uh, what they what they want to do, because I'm I'm slightly suspicious that. Now that the kind of cat is out of the bag, you know, now that we have ubiquitous statification, how are we going to get away from this technology? You know, we're not we're, we're not really sort of competent to do it anymore. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that if that sort of answers it or that's I think that's where that's where I've kind of gotten to in terms of this, this sort of the shapes that move around in the back of that. Those, uh, you know, trying to read and, and write as much as I can about document disposal and data erasure. Thank you so much, Andrew. We very much look forward to reading your book. I think it's really interesting, your coverage of uh, aspects such as power, trust, and, and a lot more that are really consistent across the three presentations uh, today. Um, just briefly before we wrap up, Scarlett, I might turn to you for a moment, um, if you could share any information with us about your forthcoming book related to the, your talk as well about policing welfare, governing welfare fraud and non-compliance, um, if you can just sort of succinctly provide an overview of what you hope to achieve with that. Yes, yes, well, I well, that's a, it's good because it's due just in a couple of weeks, uh, the manuscript, so it's pretty close to <laughs> on its way. Um, but basically it's a um, examination of the, whole, the full gamut of tools and technologies that are used to police welfare fraud and non-compliance with a focus on the Australian context, but certainly um, embedded in the kind of international um, or at least Western um, uh, literature and um, drawing comparisons elsewhere. Um, so it looks at um, and categorizes these different technologies into the kind of different logics and um, to which they're aligned. So I look at preemptive te technologies, which I include in their robo debt. So it's not about risk, it's about capturing in the entire population, about casting a whole population as risky. Um, and in there also looks at sort of um, identity fraud and other claim verification processes, how they operate, their effects, um, and kind of how they sit with each other. Um, the other chapters look at things like um, what I call responsabilizing strategies. So where we ask um, members of the community to police each other. So things like tip offs, um, as well as we ask welfare recipients to police themselves. So we ask them to um, self correct and talk about 
um, their responsibility to sort of self-scrutinise, as well as things like actual uh, fraud prosecutions and the use of intelligence-led policing and the kind of establishment of a whole police force effectively in the welfare state and the effects of those. And I think looking at all, all together, it's very much contributed to a kind of more punitive welfare state. These processes of criminalising welfare fraud have, have definitely extended beyond the problem of fraud per se, and they affect how welfare it's delivered. But I also try to pay attention, as I have in this presentation, to the kind of points of um, where things don't fit or don't match, uh, where there's been contest and challenge. So I try to kind of um, be a bit more nuanced in the kind of overarching, totalising, punitive welfare state as if, because I think that's quite pessimistic too. Where, where do we go from there? So I try to examine moments of more progressive um, change and um, or where we can instill more progressive values in the welfare state. So that's a bit of a summary. Um, hopefully it'll be finished soon and out next year. Very much looking forward to that as well, Scarlett. And, and that's what I appreciate with both yourself and Andrew, that nuanced approach to all your work to see where to go to from here. And unfortunately, where we're going from here is we're out of time. So no, we would no, like we could do we this. Are. Oh, I love this. Talk very today. common. It's very common when um, we're in discussion with Andrew and Scala. I must say that at the time, time flies, certainly. But we would like to thank our wonderful guests, Dr. Scarlett Wilcock, Dr. Andrew Whelan, and of course, Professor Marin Jensen for their time and also their willingness to share with us their work and really engage in this really important transdisciplinary dialogue. Um, for those who are interested, we have an extended version of um, this presentation, this session, including a reflection and Q&A session with Professor Janssen on open government and related themes, and that will be available shortly. Uh, this extended version, inclusive of the recording for today's session, will be posted on the School for the Future of Innovation in Society's YouTube channel, and we'll also be making it available on IEEE TV. Um, again, my co-host Katina Michael and I would like to thank you all for your attendance. Thank you our wonderful guests and our events team for their continued support and as always we look forward to seeing you in the next session of series four of the pit colloquium thank you thanks thanks robert thanks katina thank you Thank you so very much, Professor Marin Jansen, for generously giving your time today to join our colloquium and what I would say is an international forum for discussion on the public interest. A theme that I would say has underpinned your presentation today as you describe the relationship between governments and citizens in open government um, context, the significance of transparency, of trust, and, and certainly the value of the need um, for emergent governance models. I would like to invite my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, to reflect on your talk and ask any questions she may have before returning perhaps to a question or two of my own. Well, weren't we spoiled today, Robert, uh, listening to Professor Jensen and uh, really honing in on public oversight and innovation environment, the inside in and the outside in, um, and looking at how people can access uh, data. This is taxpayer generated data we're talking about. In 2015, uh, I was asked to consult for the Prime Minister and Cabinet in Australia at the federal level and talk about how that data would be broken open. Interestingly, they weren't so interested in app development because they thought that would constrain access to the population at large. They were looking at different platforms by which they could open up the data and allow people to access the data freely, uh, whether they were, as uh, Marin mentioned, politicians, citizens, businesses, uh, others in the public administration or so forth. It was all about getting access to raw data. But as we saw through the case studies as well, uh, an important uh, intermediary role by businesses is to try and uh, make sense of the data and make it accessible uh, through various means to farmers, to those who need it, put it in the hands of uh, everyday people. Interestingly, we also heard from Professor Jensen the importance of what he didn't call crowdsourcing, but did talk about sensors and putting these in thousands of people's hands and this spurring off to citizen science. Uh, recently, we completed a paper on uh, AI productivity and citizen science for the OECD. And it was very interesting to see that this is all wrapping into uh, the importance of this governance requirement over who owns the data, the quality of the data, the vintage of the data, uh, 
how it's being used, its completeness, and of course, in general, its quality. But looking at next steps and this important notion you've put forward about collaborative opportunities and collaboratives, but also this location specific push to the citizen that might require it to spur on more activity. How often do you think government can reach everyday citizens, Professor, before it gets too much, where we say too much information, too little knowledge? Is there a requirement to have this touch point and how often perhaps? Yeah, thank you for your uh, reflections and uh, for your question. It's quite funny. When you, we think about uh, citizens or when governments think about citizens, they think, from, oh, yeah, they want to uh, interact with the government. But look at yourself. Nobody wants to interact with the government. Nobody uh, likes, why, why, why should we? We go to a soccer game or something like that. That's what we like. And we, we, we use some social media to interact. But that's not face it. Eh? We don't go to a government website or to uh, interact for fun uh, or something like that. So we have to make it attractive and provide incentives for the public to be able to uh, interact. And that's why I recognize also what you're saying with making raw data available. That's what a lot of uh, uh, governments do. But what happens when you make uh, raw data available, but a, often an immense amount of raw data is made available and then nothing happens. And uh, that's why you have to make also trade off uh, between act for experts, uh, journalists, people who will have the time. Raw data is very useful. They can go into it, but for just the public, they can't make sense out of the raw data. You need some nice visualizations. You need some nice uh, app, and you need some uh, companies or maybe the government uh, themselves to stimulate uh, uh, what they develop and uh, what they're doing it and be aware of it because people just saying from, oh yeah, we make our data available and we are there. Well, it's not about uh, uh, the, the, the push side. It's not about the number of data sets because it's so easy to, to open a large number of uh, data sets without uh, creating any value at all. So who cares about it? Then I think you're just wasting taxpayers' money because you're opening something that is uh, uh, not uh, needed. Um, and then, yeah, the citizens, they like to collaborate if it concerns them. Eh? If it's in their backyard, then they get active. Eh? Then they, they, they become activists or they if they really care about it. What I see nowadays, that's why I like the, the pollution or emission data, those kind of things. People care about it. This is really an issue for them. They see from, oh, oh people might get ill from it. Uh, it might hurt is our, our environment. So they become activists, that kind of activists. And is that bad or not? Well, I, I don't know, but they have a concern and they want to express their concern. And I think it's important to ensure that you have uh, in one way or another that the, the, the citizens can express their concern. Uh, it's not easy to do it, to co collaborate uh, together. And we know that uh, trust plays a role. Eh? The, 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 those who collaborate should trust each other. Eh? That's one of the uh, conditions or a main uh, factor on it. Also, the power balance should be uh, uh, a little bit even. Eh? Or it might also be that one party with a lot of power takes the lead. That could also be uh, uh, the case. That's, that could also be one of the uh, factors. But there are a lot of factors that influencing uh, it. And we often don't, don't know that. So it, it, yeah, it's like collaborating in other type of situations from uh, we have to watch and look for what's happening over there. And there's some anecdotal uh, work, of course. And eh? this was also largely anecdotal what I presented today. There's some uh, more general uh, studies on it, but not, not for those kinds of purposes. And there's a reason for it because we don't have that many examples. And the more we examples we have, maybe we can just generalizing and uh, looking uh, for it. But arriving at those examples is quite uh, challenging. And now I'm start talking and now I forget what was your question at the beginning, uh, Katina. I think you answered it very well there. And uh, you pointed at the end towards a collaborative, which is bi-directional feedback loops. It's not just the government to the citizen, but whoa, wouldn't the government love to hear from the citizen and somehow have this exchange occur and this additional feedback through interaction. I think I'll pass back to our chair, Roba, and over to you. 
Thank you, Katina. I might um, emphasize, Professor Janssen, some of the statements you spoke about, um, collaboration, engagement, and so on, but even looking beyond engagement, I know some of your work, your more recent publications, for example, you focus on empowerment in open government, and the PIT colloquium is very much centered on exploring the role of government dynamics and relationships in terms of those who are governing and the governed and how we develop frameworks, models, and a lot more to support and facilitate citizen empowerment. Um, so following on from Katina's question, I'm curious, Professor Janssen, how do you envisage the empowerment, so beyond collaboration of the citizens in the context of open government? And what do you perceive to be some of the opportunities for empowering citizens and significantly the challenges and the barriers, some of which you, you touched on already? Thank you. Uh, uh, so also a difficult uh, question, not easy to, uh, to, to answer because empowerment is a very complex uh, construct. And we often think in this case, from we give them data and now we empower them. Well, of course, nobody's empowered. Eh? Give, them, uh, give them a lot of uh, things and they might be lost in it and maybe they spend their resources in it. So to empower, there are a lot of conditions that are important. Eh? You have to have the skills and the expertise. You might need to have the infrastructure, also the access, eh? if it's large volumes of data, eh? you can't just do it on your smartphone or something like that. Eh? You need might really need an infrastructure for being able to uh, process it. So it's about setting the conditions also for empowerment. And if the conditions are not there, well, we can talk about empowerment, but it will not happen that, we, that uh, the people feel empowered. So you have to think about what are really the conditions, the constraints uh, which need to be satisfied. And thereafter, it's also needed to give incentives because people often are not aware that they're able to do things. And you can have a beautiful infrastructure, nobody uses it. So you need to have a certain critical mass to stimulate and provide incentive before they start using it. And once that happens, yeah, then uh, we get to real empowerment because for me, the way to evaluate empowerment is very simple, to look at the, uh, uh, their influence from citizens on government policies. And if there's no uh, influence at all, then they do, uh, then they play a lot and uh, they participate and they engage and uh, whatever, but then there's no real empowerment because there's no impact at the end and no value creation. So I would also hear, like you're saying, from uh, look at the whole feedback uh, loops and the iterations in, in uh, because else we take a too narrow view. No, absolutely. So much to think about there, Professor. Um, I think I might end on a question talking to the theme of our colloquium, if I may, uh, which is toward transdisciplinarity. Um, so given the theme of the colloquium and your presentation, which specifically discussed the, I think you framed it, the shifting relationships at all levels. And again, talking to that theme of empowerment, you mentioned the system of public administration changing and us requiring new ways of arranging institutions. Um, in your experience, what are some of the important elements that, in that regard, particularly where multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity is concerned? So do you see a role for transdisciplinary uh, approaches and frameworks? And, and what are your general thoughts about that theme? Uh, yes, yes, I can only answer yes. Uh, from, uh, uh, it's very important uh, uh, and the, the, the relevance is uh, clear. Eh? We, we need more interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches uh, uh, to, to cover it. And what you see is uh, each time and uh, different disciplines and different ways of looking at it might be relevant. So it's not so that we're able to say we need this, this or that. It's each time it's dependent on the ground challenge or the type of problem uh, we tackle, the type of expertise needed, but it's all, always interdisciplinary. That's for sure. And it's almost always transdisciplinary also. That's also for sure, but how to pinpoint it, uh, it's, it's always, I think, to, to put it a little bit bluntly, uh, we need technology people, we need more the organizational uh, people, the social uh, people, that's for sure. They need always to be uh, uh, combined, but what kind of technology? It's also dependent on the situation. If you need data scientists or software engineers who would develop a platform or maybe them all 
or social scientists will understand policy making or understand the public administration structure if we need them probably we need them also all and that makes it also quite complex because you know if we would collaborate together with large teams then uh, we don't talk to each other anymore because the team is too large so we have also to keep it at a certain uh, yeah certain size that is manageable and maybe we have multiple uh, teams that can collaborate and multiple universities that can uh, collaborate and then we slowly move towards this but i think we have a long path to go it's not uh, it's not easy Definitely. I think um, we would agree with you on that point, on the complexity, on the importance of talking to each other across technical and non-technical boundaries, and also the importance of expertise, which we had, a, in fact, a dedicated session to as um, part of this colloquium series. But um, I think that brings us to the end of this very stimulating session, Professor Jansen, of the fourth series of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. My co-host Katina Michael and I would like to thank you so very much um, for joining us today and for sharing your extensive experience and your expertise on open government and so many other rich related themes. Um, uh, I'm sure there are many questions to come from this discussion. Uh, there's evidently a lot of work to be done in this space and we look forward to having those further discussions with you about what's required and the community at large. Um, in closing, we would like to note that the recording for this session will be available on the School for the Future of Innovation in Society's YouTube channel and will also be posting on IEEE TV. And we look forward to seeing you in the next session of the PIT Colloquium um, to all of you who are viewing this and to you, Professor Janssen, to further discussion and um, collaboration uh, on this theme and others. A good day to everyone and thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.